Let's start our session. Our first speaker is, is going to be uh, Dr. Thiago Massoni, Dr. Gisele Moreno. I would say that uh, Gisele had some family problems, so she won't be able to come this afternoon. But uh, Dr. Thiago is from the Federal University of Campina Grande and uh, is going to talk about the mosquito surveillance in Northeast Brazil, how it works and lessons learned. I'm not going to talk about the, the, bi the biography of the speakers. It's in the brochure of the event, so please go there and look at it. Uh, uh, with uh, three, three minutes before 10, I give you warning, one minute okay. before 10, and that's okay. 10. Thank you. I cut your head. Uh, <laughs> no, it's well, kidding. the first challenge is to figure out how to clip this in my, my shirt. Uh, but Great. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Asha. Very nice. Um, okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here today. And after more than two years of uh, Zoom meetings and conferences and presentations, we're finally uh, believing that people are real again. So they are not you know, only avatars in, in some electronic uh, medium. Uh, but my name is Tiago. I'm a professor at this university here in Brazil. It's UFCG. CG is from Campina Grande. Uh, this uh, Giselle is, is working with us. Uh, she's as Tercio said, she's, uh, unfortunately, she's not able to, to come. But uh, together with uh, three universities uh, in Brazil, we participate, we're part of this uh, MEWAR uh, project. Uh, UFCG is the blue one there uh, in the countryside of the northeast of Brazil. We have UFPE from Pernambuco and the, in the, in the coast. And you have, we have USP uh, in Sao Paulo. So this is, uh, when we talk about vector-borne disease uh, in general, the first one that comes to mind in Brazil is dengue, right? Uh, let me translate this uh, headline here that I just read in a newspaper. In Brazil, we had this year 500 deaths by dengue. Uh, and there are uh, one point million reported cases from January to June. So it's a, really a big deal uh, in terms of uh, public health and in terms of, of course, the death rate and also uh, the, the, you know, the, the social debt, the, the social problem it causes because these, the, 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 the mosquito uh, born uh, diseases. Uh, they uh, are very, uh, uh, the cases in this, uh, f from uh, these uh, diseases are uh, very uh, present in the whole population, in the, regardless of uh, uh, social uh, layer or uh, economic situation or if neighborhoods, this is, it's only, uh, it's just very, uh, uh, the, the, the way that the disease is uh, transmitted, uh, it's uh, independent of everything. You just have to uh, have a, a portion of water or still water where the mosquitoes breed. And then you can have this in the rainy seasons, for example. So in places where you don't have uh, appropriate care of the disposals and garbage, for example. So this is the, the, the biggest problem in, in public health, one of the biggest problems we have. Uh, for fighting this uh, problem, the government has this uh, national program which tries to reduce the infestation of the mosquito. Well, so it tries to fight the vector for uh, try, uh, trying to avoid transmission and uh, reduce the incidence of these three diseases, mainly dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. Uh, and try to reduce deaths. 
by the most dangerous uh, type of dengue, which is hemorrhagic dengue, which is probably uh, usually when you get you 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 get the disease in the second or the third time, it's more dangerous. Uh, they're more risky to have this type of uh, more dangerous type of the disease. Uh, but the most uh, the closest layer of uh, care in terms of public health, uh, the ones that are actually dealing with the population directly and trying to uh, minimize the, the, the transmission and the, the mosquito breeds are the community health workers, right? So this is the layer that we try to work with. So they are the, the, the first layer of healthcare because they go, uh, they are paid by the government, so they are uh, governor, uh, government uh, employees, staff. So they go to houses and visit the houses. They try to identify mosquito breeds and possible uh, uh, sources of infestation. And they go and try to give a supplementary health care in terms of uh, at least educational purposes, like going to the houses and trying to teach people uh, how to avoid it, and how they take care of things in, at home, and even um, doing uh, uh, applying some larvicides uh, on the uh, on the most dangerous or mo uh, most uh, appropriate places in a home. So each agent is usually overloaded with a lot of visits they have to do. Every two months, approximately 1,000 properties must be visited by one agent only. Uh, in average, 25 to 30 properties each day. So there are uh, several, uh, the, the, the main responsibilities of these agents is first the detection of the positive cases, collect samples of the, the water to go to bring it to the labs and try to detect the breeds and also give a report of these visitations for inputting this into a national system which is used by the federal government for uh, report, uh, reporting uh, uh, trends and trying to control and give some information uh, for decision making. Uh, but there are, you know, uh, you can see that there are uh, many, many limitations in this work. Uh, first, it's uh, essentially low-tech. So it's uh, based on paper forms that they have to, each property, they go and they ask for the address, they write it down, they, they have to fill all the information that is required by this national system. Uh, but they have to do it on paper, and then they, they go and put it in the in uh, uh, national system. The work is risky. There are modest conditions. I'll talk more about this in the panel later. Uh, and usually lack of motivation and lack of training. Uh, uh, actually, the activity in general is poorly monitored because there are no, not enough agents and or supervisors to doing this work. So one of the, some of the objectives with uh, our, our uh, uh, work there, uh, our cooperation with, with the agents, with the, with the, the public uh, health system in these two cities, Campina Grande and Recife, uh, is to improve the tech. It's like uh, using, trying to develop apps to replace paperwork, for example. Uh, improve motivation, trying to minimize repetitive work so they could use the app and um, maybe not required to uh, enter so much uh, repetitive information. So they could get this uh, information from sensors, IoT in general. So this could fuel them, uh, pre, uh, give them a pre filled uh, report. Uh, improve the method, actually, improve method for providing info population which is the most time-consuming activity they have usually uh, so as I said these are the two cities that we're working with the agents uh, first a for example 
you have these uh, regions here. Uh, this, this is one region, uh, one neighborhood of the city, right? So it's divided in small uh, portions. And this, each of these portions is assigned to one agent. So they have to uh, visit, it's a bit small here, but you have like 800 or eight, uh, 900 properties in each of these uh, uh, areas. And you have Campina Grande as well, using a system that is similar. There's a, a bit of a problem here because each city in Brazil, they have their own uh, policy for dealing with uh, some of the, uh, of the details of the work. But anyway, uh, this is, uh, I'm not giving so much, many details about the, the app or the, uh, uh, the system because uh, we can talk about, uh, about this later. But there is a system, uh, a small, uh, like a small application for the agents and one small application for the supervisors to assign the places and give the agents one part, uh, part of the information that they need to go to each resident and property and using the app with the smartphone, for example, for doing that. I'll give you more, uh, I'll talk more about the limitations in these suggestions or this, uh, these propositions we're doing in the panel uh, by the, uh, this evening here. But anyway, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Thiago. Questions? No questions. So you said the, the, the people takes 20 houses per, the, per day? Or uh, 20, it's, 20 is, uh, is probably uh, underestimated. <laughs> it's probably more, uh, yeah. 25 to 30, because there are shortage of agents. The, the, the career is not very attractive, I see. usually. So they always have less agents that they need. So it's usually they are overloaded with, uh, with uh, visiting, uh, the visits they have. They actually cannot cover all the areas uh, of one neighborhood, for example, because of that. So they usually uh, have to gather uh, agents that have finished their uh, previous uh, assignment areas. So they go to an covered area, so they have to complete the cycle. Uh, so this is a, a big issue. It's like uh, having a, uh, the, the work they have to do, and they, they get awarded for doing a good job by getting more work, right? That's good. So uh, th this, is, this is not very, uh, it's not a good incentive, right? For, for doing their goal, the uh, good work. Thank you. Any question? Oh, yes. I'm well. I, I have a question. Um, so, are, completion, are agents awarded based on completion rates of, like, a, say, like a particular area? So, like, say, if an agent achieves like 100% completion of an area, are they given some kind of award or some kind of incentive, or is it just like? Well, there's, there's, this is a, actually a frequent complaint we get, we hear when we go and to talk to them, is that uh, if you complete your cycle early, before somebody else, uh, you're getting to cover other areas that are not covered before. So. This, this is the wrong incentive, right? This is like you, you give incentive for not doing your job because if you do your job well, you're going to have more work. So this is a frequent complaint we get. Um, and there's a pressure from the good agents, like the productive agents, to the supervisors to uh, improve control over the agents that are not very productive. So uh, there you have this, uh, you know, uh, small war between groups, like the ones that are productive, the ones that are not so productive. So they're keeping, uh, they're, they keep this uh, conflict. So the supervisors, 
do not have the information that is needed for doing this control. And with this app, for example, we could do that. They were very excited, the supervisors were very excited with the idea that they could uh, follow the progress of each agent because they don't know that with the paper form. They get the paper forms in the end of the cycle. They don't know what happened in the in, in the in between, right? In the, uh, uh, in the meantime, so with that, like having your record every day, the visitors you had, the positive cases you detected, uh, right out you in real time, it would be like a big achievement. So this is something that they are they were very excited about. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Chai. Thank you. One of the speakers is Professor Wellington Pinheiro dos Santos uh, and uh, PhD students Ana Clara Gomes from the University Federal of Pernambuco and also the Polytechnic School uh, of the University of Pernambuco. And uh, the title is Spatial Temporal Forecasting for Dengue, Chikungunya Fever, and Zika using uh, machine learning and artificial expert communities based on meta heuristics. And uh, oh, Anna is going to talk. Okay. okay. Um, she, she will uh, speak after, after me. Okay. Three minutes before 10, I give a sign. One minute before okay. 10, then 10. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, so, this is our work, spatial temporal forecasting for uh, dengue, chikungunya fever, and Zika using machine learning and artificial aspect committees based on metaheuristics. Uh, so, uh, uh, we were motivated. This, this work is inserted into the, uh, the, the, the biggest viewer project, and uh, here we are more focused on uh, the uh, data mining regarding the, the all, all the data from uh, from the, uh, the the arboviruses that are transmitted from the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Uh, so uh, uh, it's a, it's a fact that uh, uh, in the uh, these uh, the, the emergences of, of more infectious diseases uh, like the ones we are talking about are uh, uh, very correlated, uh, strongly correlated with uh, the climatic changes and, and environmental changes uh, and so on. So uh, as a consequence of uh, inviting uh, uh, the human populations, inviting uh, the new environments, new biomes, we have the emergence of new viruses that migrate from animal populations to human populations. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, we hope that uh, uh, joining variables from multiple, um, uh, multiple databases uh, could they get the prediction of this, these diseases. Uh, but uh, in fact, we don't know in which case, uh, uh, which are the most important factors that affect the, the forecasting of these diseases. So uh, we believe that uh, uh, using meteoristic methods, uh, mostly uh, 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 based on the evolutionary computing and so intelligence, uh, it could highlight uh, uh, what are the most rele relevant factors that could optimize uh, um, a forecasting model. So uh, we, uh, we are proposing an uh, artificial uh, express committee and in, in this, uh, this artificial express committee uh, each uh, artificial uh, expert uh, is modeled as, uh, uh, as an algorithm for uh, uh, optimization and search. Uh, so uh, we uh, adapted uh, I think it's five, five algorithms so uh, our research hypothesis, hypothesis that, uh, that uh, geographic information databases uh, with uh, climatic, environmental, and health information could be useful to build uh, efficient disease predictors that uh, could be able to predict uh, the spatial temporal distribution of cases with uh, acceptable error. And uh, we can combine 
uh, different uh, intelligent agents to aid to determine the most important variables uh, for the forecasting task. Uh, our area under study was the city of Recife that uh, was already presented by, by my colleague, Tiago. Uh, it's located in the northeastern uh, region of Brazil. It's a, a, a part of, of the, the uh, uh, tropical area that is uh, almost 70% of the, the country. Uh, and we are uh, in this uh, in this research we use uh, uh, the following databases uh, use the uh, APAC database that is a database that uh, 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 in, in which we collect the the it's a public database and in which we collect the information the geographic information from the climactic variables uh, like the, the the rainfall data and uh, uh, the uh, they have uh, they collect uh, uh, this information daily using uh, latitude and longitude as well. Uh, we also used the uh, information from the National Institute of Meteorology uh, in MET, uh, temperature in, in uh, Celsius degrees, wind speed, uh, and uh, we collected this information for, from three uh, meteorological stations in Recife. And uh, we also have used a uh, 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 public database uh, that was uh, given uh, to us uh, in this database. We have uh, the uh, information from uh, the years 2013 to 2016 from the cases and uh, we, uh, about the cases of uh, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika and where these cases were registered. So, um, here is the uh, general overview of what we think about uh, 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 could be a, a, a good system to, to aid the, the forecasting of the arbor viruses. Uh, so uh, we have multiple uh, databases, databases that are already exist, like the, uh, uh, the ones that in which we can get uh, 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 wind speed, geospatial uh, information, temperature, uh, rainfall, uh, and uh, the databases that are, are furnished by the, the public system, the Brazilian public system, in which we can get uh, the uh, cases and the partial addresses of the, the patients. And uh, as we expect uh, within the MUA project, we could have uh, another database to, to fit this system that, uh, that could be uh, uh, built by uh, the geocodification of the breeding sites, mosquito breeding sites. The, and, and in this case, we have the, the, the app, uh, the app dedicated for the, the environmental health agents to, agents to, uh, to, to fill this database. So our proposal is uh, collecting all this data and forming uh, uh, geodata from building maps and uh, making the uh, forecasting and analyzing uh, what, what are the, 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 the more important uh, variables involved in prediction. So this is the general overview. This is our hope uh, to, to build a, a complete system. Uh, and now uh, Anna Clara is going to talk about uh, the uh, experimental results. Okay, uh, the result is we considered uh, good with uh, have a, okay. The result is considered good if we have a R coefficient is greater than 90 point, uh, 0.9 and the RMSA is less than 5%. Uh, the good results, the, the, I'm sorry, good results uh, can be obtained in MLP, uh, SBM, 
A, ALM, and Randall Forrest. Uh, the, 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 the best is model uh, considering the uh, <coughs> coefficient uh, RMSL and the trying the trying time is the uh, Randall Forest with uh, a three uh, with a ten hour ten three. Um, good. Yes. Uh, so these are the, uh, the uh, our uh, qualitative results. Uh, so uh, uh, here we have the forecasting results for the uh, six by uh, by masters from uh, year 2014. Uh, so we can see that uh, in this uh, uh, red and orange areas in the south mainly and uh, almost in the west, uh, we have uh, much much more cases much more cases of, uh, in this case, dengue, okay? But uh, in the year 2015, uh, we had the, the occurrence of uh, Zika virus. Uh, so uh, here we have uh, uh, cases of dengue, uh, chikungunya fever, and Zika virus. So we, can, we could perceive that uh, there were uh, uh, in the following year in the next year uh, we had uh, more cases in the, in the beginning of the year in the north uh, and uh, in the, the, the end of the year uh, we had uh, some uh, uh, a, a more controlled situation but uh, we believe that the number of environmental health agents is still uh, insufficient because uh, the situation in the end of the, the year 2015 was, uh, was not as good as uh, the, uh, the authorities, the health authorities wanted it to be. Uh, in the year 2016, after the, uh, the occurrence of the, uh, uh, the uh, Zika virus outbreak, uh, we had an even worse situation. Uh, so. Uh, we can see that it's quite important to uh, not only adopt new technologies, but uh, uh, to augment the, the, the teams of, uh, uh, the, uh, for the uh, surveillance as well. So, uh, we, uh, with this proposal, we were able to, uh, to get uh, predictions with uh, relatively uh, good uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative results using the, uh, the Pearson coefficient, R coefficient, it was uh, uh, higher than 0 0.9, uh, then, and the, the percentile RMSE uh, was above 5%, and our committee of artificial experts uh, was able to identify the most relevant factors in uh, each uh, bimester. So uh, that was we we had to present to you uh, today, but we have the uh, the opportunity to to talk a bit more about this work. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Professor Wellington. Any questions for them? Please. Oh, okay. Uh, 
one day to choose by one day to get into the uh, meteorological parameters or any other parameters that would be considered as well? Okay, uh, let's start by the end. Okay, uh, so uh, we organized the data uh, in the following, uh, according to the, the following uh, uh, organization. Uh, we, we had to follow uh, the same organization that is adopted, uh, that nationally adopted by the, the Public Health Brazilian system. So uh, in, in order to make uh, forecastings uh, regarding uh, uh, arboviruses, uh, they use uh, as, a, as a base the bimester. So they divide the year into uh, six bimesters, January, February, uh, March, April, and so on. So uh, we had this as units. So in order to, uh, uh, in, in, uh, to, to add the, the, fact, the climatic factors, we had to, uh, to add the, the, uh, the sample average of the, uh, each month. So we have the number, uh, the total number of cases in the, our, uh, uh, sorry, our, our window of uh, prediction is a year, because uh, why we're, uh, are we using year? Uh, because uh, due to the the uh, life cycle of the fire of the the, the, the mosquito, because uh, the mosquito uh, lived just for two, three weeks, but the eggs could uh, survive uh, from uh, the summer to the rainy stations until a year. So it's recommended to, uh, in order to, to try to forecast uh, uh, that you could uh, involve not, not just the, the, the mosquito lice, but uh, 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 the, uh, this, the sur surviving of the, the egg as well. So we have, uh, we have as a, a prediction window a year, and uh, using a year, we have, uh, uh, we have the following factors. We have the, uh, for uh, each bimester, from the six bimesters, the number of cases, okay? uh, the uh, latitude, longitude, number of cases, um, the uh, sample uh, temperature average, uh, the uh, this, uh, sample uh, humidity average uh, from each month, okay, the, the, the sample average from each month, and uh, wind, uh, wind speed. So we have, uh, I think we have 44, 44 attributes, okay, and we collect this from the, 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 uh, uh, the meteorological stations, but uh, uh, since we have just three uh, meteorological stations, we have to, uh, to make uh, interpolations to uh, generate uh, an, irregular, uh, an irregular grid and to uh, estimate the, 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 this, uh, this data in the uh, unknown latitudes and longitudes. Uh, may I suggest to continue during the cough break? So it's okay, better. Yes, it'll be fine. And sorry, because so for the sake of the time. Yeah, there was another question. Can Okay, it could be afterwards. Okay, sorry for Thank the long you. answer. No, no. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Miss Aisha of Dorsary yes. from the house, actually, from the Center for Digital Public Health uh, in Emergencies here at the University College of London. And she's going to talk about the smart mosquito. Uh, over traps and mobile surveillance. So, hello everyone. Uh, as Tercio introduced me, I'm a I'm a third year PhD student at the Digital Public Health uh, Center. So I'm I'm part of the Monware project where it's like running in Brazil. I'm doing my PhD as part of this project as well. So uh, today I'm to, I will talk, I will, I, to be honest, I just changed my mind. I will just skip a part, which is where, because we already covered by Tiago uh, part. So I will not talk more about the app we, deal, we develop. So what we did for Brazil so far is just from the DBH part is like we developed a mobile app where we have like a platform where for the manager, uh, for the manager agent and for the agent at the field. 
So one for the managing and allocating the task, and the, the other side, the agents can like just recording instead of the paper form, which Tiago have discussed. So I think this bit is already covered by uh, Tiago. And again, like we have a lot, we're going through several challenges in the ground. Unfortunately, we wasn't involved because of COVID. So Tiago is the first person like to re report all these challenge. So I, probably at the panel, we will discuss more about the challenges of piloting an app at the, at the field. So the second bit of what I'm working on is like a smart uh, IoT platforms or IoT based platform, which is Internet of Things, or maybe we can simply just say sensor devices, is dependent on like what you are collecting. So uh, mainly what I'm doing, this bit is more like, we actually developed a radio, like a, um, a prototype, it's an IoT based uh, smart, we call it smart over trap system. Uh, it's actually like the, the idea is coming like from, from two from two parts. Like the, the background behind this idea is like, if you wanted to control mosquito, which is very obvious, is like we will go back to the climate things and the water because the mosquito will breed only on the water, cannot breed in different environments. This is the habitat, plus the weather. So two factors are two, two main things significantly impact the, the mosquito during her life cycle. So in terms of the water variables, like we are, we're, sorry, the weather variables, we are focusing in three things, which is the temperature, uh, humidity, and air pressure. In terms of the, of the water, it's more like a physiochemical parameters of the water or the water quality of the, of the water itself, where is the, where we're, yeah, I, I will keep this for the later. So we're actually collecting some parameters, which is considered as a quality, water quality parameters. If you say why, why, why this idea, what's the, what's the point of having real-time data or like continuous real-time data, why you are using sensors? Yes, like what's, what exists now in the literature is more focusing on remote sensing, more, more focus in water station as a tool to collect the data. So the main idea behind our project is like really is about how to collect the data. So we try to find a way to collect the data, to have continuous data, real-time, and like more clean and robust system rather than having like the water station because we thought or we think actually the, the mosquito is like first of all it's like species specific and context specific so it's very impacted by where it's where the where it's located where the it's like even the altitude the elevation things is very important so we we thought like having building your model in a data that's at a final spatial scales, not a large scale, will, will have a huge or significant impact on the modeling accuracy. So from here, we came up with the idea of the water sensor. One more thing is about what Willington said when he answered one of the questions was very important. Controlling the mosquito at the life, you have to know which life, like the life cycle of the mosquito start by eggs, larvae, and then an adult mosquito. Deciding which which at which levels, uh, at, which, at, which, at which stage of the life cycle is very important. So controlling the mosquito as an adult, which is we will have a talk about it as well, we would, is, is, still, is still like significant. However, like controlling it at the beginning, at eggs level and larva level will have more significantly impact, significant impact comparing at adult stage. Sometimes say, some, some, some literature is saying like, is approved and it's like controlling the mosquito at the adult level maybe it's, quite late to take control measurements or like to prevent any outbreak. So if you manage to control at the, which what they call it, a mature stage, it's, it's more significant. So this is how the idea has come about the IoT water based system. So what we call, we call this system mosquito over trap IoT sensing system. Why we call it over trap? Because we, we deployed, we, the idea is to deploy this sensor in the IoT, in the over trap buckets. So we will use the uh, over trap bucket and we will deploy, implement or place our props and collect the, the parameters through these sensors. So what the system will give us, will give you a real time data, continuous data. The system's kind of robust, so it's you, d you don't need to go to the field. You don't need to like having also manual input. The, also for the water parameters, there's one, one like maybe challenge. Like most of the people, how they do it, they use a portable, a portable like multi-parameter sensor. And then you have to go to the field by yourself, collect the data and go back. Or sometimes they implement some sensor in the field and keep it running, but still it's the, the data will be collected in like a temporary memory, memory. And then you have to go to the field, take this memory. So again, it's like, you need human involved, and, and then the accuracy, I, I, 
again, it's not, it's, you need to have a continuous data to see the impact, especially in the tropical area where the, the elevation is making a big difference, where like from the north of the city to the south of the city, the climate is totally different. So this is one thing we, we are like hoping the big achievement is to have real time and continuous data instead of like instance data. This is, will help us to build more robust model as well in terms of like understanding the impact of the environment on mosquito breeding or like the, at the level of the production and the development. We will see how these parameters could really impact the, the, the production and the, of, the, uh, of, the mosquitoes, of the mosquito. Maybe it's if we have, if we like having integrate these data with other data sources, we can have like and uh, finding and most influential variables or drivers in terms of mosquito breeding as well. So putting this, having this data with other data sources will make, will help us to build a more robust and more accurate uh, uh, modeling. So this is an architecture of the system, like the, how it's built in terms of hardware and the software as well. Uh, the system is like, implemented around Arduino board is like Arduino which have also like a, um, a built-in SIM card which is one of the I would say good characteristic about this board and this is why we use it so it's depend on the network so you, the SIM card you don't need like a GCM or something else it's the same card the same board so we use the same board with the, with the built-in SIM card the system is 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 working is, is designed to be working with a solar power system as well as the power supply okay I have three minutes left and then the software all is in the server so it all in the cloud server so that's me and you can get the data which is what's happening now I'm here in London I'm receiving the data from the census so this is how the system looks like this is the first prototype of the system we are planning to, make, like, based on the first uh, primary analysis of the data, we decide to make some amendments. So this is the first prototype, and hopefully next version is coming with, like, with some adding more sensors and do some extra things based on the first analysis. This is where we deployed the first system. It was deployed in the Natural History Museum of Funchal. Data is coming from the sensor. However, we are collaborating with the health environmental agent there as well. So they, we are receiving a weekly data about uh, the eggs and larvae, and then we will have like a data set, enough data set to make to make our analysis. So this is, the system has been deployed since November last year, so probably like six months or above. Yeah. So this is the type of data we are receiving. We have the maps over here. Here is actually this is maybe the most important bit, which is the future work for us. Like we, we this is the um, this is the map of Madeira, and these are the number of the overtrap they have so far. Uh, you can see the focus here in Funchal, where it's located. I think this is like the main capital, in the tourism area, the, uh, the capital of the island. So this is why the focus is here. Plus uh, the overside, the, the middle, and the, it's like the mountain side, and they. Again, the focus in the where the human are coming, which is we expect the mosquito to be more. They do have um, <coughs> over 100 uh, of a trap, but we are planning to deploy more sensors to have more as well robust data, probably about 20 systems to be across similar to what we have deployed, to be also installed, placed in the of a trap. One minute. And that's it. So this is the team at Madeira. We're supposed to have like Professor Nono, who is not here, and Dr. Brona as well, who's helping us in running this part. So this is the Madeira team who helped us to do this. In short notes, we just collaborated during the COVID and it was nice that like, we do everything quick, although like it was challenging to go and travel, but they, we got a very good support from the people there. And we have some people as well today to report about other senses. So that's it, I'm done. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Aisha. Yeah. Questions? Please. Thank you so much, that was fascinating. Uh, one quick question about uh, transmission of data. Yes. So, uh, how uh, is data from the uh, Orbitrum uh, transmitted to the cloud? Yes. And I, I think in your slide there was 3G or. Yeah, SIM card. So the, same, the, the Arduino board itself have a built-in SIM card. This is why I'm saying, I, I, if you ask me why you choose this, like Arduino is almost the same. So this was the best specific features about this board is like having the SIM card so you don't need like Sheld or GCM or like other. So it's, you just put, put the card inside, the SIM card inside the and then. 
no. Yeah, this is like then you need to have something different, which is like we, we some of our clients suggest the idea of the LoRa. So in case if the air, there is the coverage is not good, so then you need a LoRa. However, the accuracy may not good enough, uh, good as well as the as the SIM card, as the normal network. Also, there is another solution, but again, we will lose the real time data if we do if we do like the memory card or it's like inside just temporarily. But then the, once the connection is back, you can send the data remotely, but Again, you lose the idea of like real-time data, but still the solution in case of like no coverage. And just out of curiosity, uh, yeah. uh, is it like the training season will impact the battery uh, mm. life? Whether That's a good question. Will it be able to, to, to be charged during the training season? It depends where you're locating the stuff. So, the, so yeah, prob like this is why the tropical areas must be, uh, probably most of the year there is a sun. So we expect like this will be, but not perfect as the power supply. But I would say with the, like for example, in Brazil, I think the situation would be much better compared even to Madeira, because most of this year, like they do have the sun. Yeah, I would say it's still, it's still like one of the challenge. The, the ideal solution is the power supply, but this is an alternative solution in case of, but again, for the raining is the wind. Yeah, the, the solar, like the, if you don't have, the solar panel, as you know, like I think you know, since you asked, like, is like you can you can charge it whereas during half the day, if there is a battery still, you can keep running. Plus, the system has not is not using too much power because we don't like having too much. The data also itself is not heavy, is not images, not videos. Yeah. Okay. Please. The cost efficient. Yes, yeah, so if you compare, yeah, this one is a good, a good question. Maybe if you compare the on-shelf multi-parameter sensors, the manual one, like it's almost like more than triple the price of like assembling these, put this the one box together will cost you absolutely, is comparing with what's like an on-shelf product, yeah. That is cost effective, it's constant cost effective. Yeah, go One on. quick question. Say it again, sorry. Yes, yes. Therefore, yeah, this is the map one, yeah. No, you pass. Okay, sir. Oh, wow. Okay, the, the, the deployment, yeah, the deployment slide, okay. Yes, it's collecting. So, so uh, what we have here is actually just three props. Three props, one is for, oh, sorry. One for the temperature, one for the, humi no, sorry, props. One for the pH, one for the dissolved oxygen, one for the water temperature. And now we are planning to add more uh, like water quality sensor because again, we found like the mosquito is more like specific, species specific. So we need to know if like some parameters may be important for some species, specific species. So we don't want to like ignore something. We want to include all the water quality parameters. So for example, conductivity, salinity is not included in this prototype. However, in the future one, in the future version of the system, we will have more sensors. And in the, in the box itself, you can see there is like, there is the weather sensors. Yeah, it's all just here, like it's collecting weather, humidity, and air pressure. Okay. Yes. I think time's over. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Awar Moussa from the Department of, of Geography, University of College London. And he's going to speak about the use of spatial temporal models for predicting the burden of mosquito infection in Brazilian cities. That's good. Hello, can you folks hear me? Perfect. Okay, okay. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. And first of all, I just want to give a, a shout out to the PI and to my colleagues, uh, Tiago, Wellington, Anna, and Aisha, for just setting the tone. You know, so, um, my presentation, uh, as Professor um, Wellington spoke about predicting cases, right, 
Mine is more focused on uh, risk assessment for household levels of infestation um, across neighborhoods in Recife. And uh, basically we want to uh, apply some kind of spatial temporal model to uh, understand and quantify the risk trajectory of mosquito infestation across these neighborhoods uh, during a certain time uh, interval, say January 2015 up until October 2019 using routine data in order to kind of inform us of uh, which neighborhoods have uh, sustained risks. So just to kind of set the, set the tone, um, so there are many different species of uh, mosquitoes. So the most infamous um, family is the Anopheles, which uh, is responsible for transmitting uh, a parasitic protozoa uh, called the plasmodium, which in turn causes um, malaria in humans. And then you have this another infamous uh, species, which is the Aedes uh, species, which there are two broadly two common types, which is the Aedes um, aegypti and the Aedes uh, albopictus. And these are uh, known for causing neglected tropical diseases such as dengue, uh, chikungunya, yellow fever, and Zika, as well as uh, Rift Valley, uh, Rift, uh, Valley uh, fever as well. Just to quickly illustrate the transmission cycle, and so you have two distinct populations. So you have the uh, female Aedes mosquitoes population, and you have a group of susceptibles. And so the, the, the virus is transmitted by the female uh, mosquitoes, but for them in turn to get infected, they must get into, into contact with someone who has already been bitten by an infective mosquito. Once that mosquito takes a blood meal from that infected host, uh, that, that female mosquito gets infected maybe in their early stages in their life cycle as well. And then one week after, they'll go and take another blood meal so that they can use it for nourishing their eggs for egg production. And then that's how the kind of transmission cycles kind of retain. And so it's like the, they'll take a blood meal and then they would infect another host as well. And then they'll produce a progeny which would contribute again to their population, but then that female mosquito had fulfilled her duty and then she passes away. And oh. so that's how the cycle is oh, retained. Sure. So just to kind of also illustrate the kind of global distribution of where these mosquitoes are. So this is a quite an interesting map because this was developed sometime in the 1950s. So there is a really ancient uh, atlas called the Atlas of Diseases which is published in the American Geographical Society. And you can have access to so many old disease maps, but what they've done is uh, they've tried to kind of outline the um, transmission uh, uh, areas of where uh, yellow fever and uh, dengue can occur. And you can see that it is mainly concentrated in uh, the central part of sub-Saharan Africa, but also like uh, in in a major section of uh, South America where you can see uh, a significant chunk of the northwest of Brazil is also like a, an area where uh, uh, the dengue and yellow fever occurrence occur. But also like the map on the um, bottom right um, shows you points of where uh, vectors are present. And so this was actually done in the 1954 if we fast forward in time, right, where we have GIS and many data, we're able to use like quite a lot of models such as ecological niches or machine learning to kind of quantify the boundaries of where these mosquitoes exist. And what they, what they show here is the red parts is where um, these environments are suitable for the uh, Aedes aegypti and the Aedes albopictus. And you can see there's a significant chunk in Brazil where um, these uh, mosquito, mosquito species exist as well. In terms of cases as well, we are able to determine as well, like, okay, 
these type of mosquitoes, where they report cases of the main type of abroviruses, so Zika, yellow fever, chikungunya, and Rift Valley, Rift Valley uh, fever as well, where countries have all the case, all the, the disease type uh, reported there. And you can see in Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, Cameroon, uh, they have all the diseases reported there. But throughout of, uh, uh, South America, with the exception of Uruguay and Chile, all the countries, they report at least four out of five types of the diseases as well. And Zika, Dengue, Yellow even Chikungunya is endemic in those countries. And so it's quite uh, an immense public health problem, especially within a South American context. So this is where, like, the Miwa family comes into play. And uh, we have like a really strong collaborative ties with um, you know, uh, community health workers in Recife, but also in uh, Campina Grande. And these are two uh, cities that have been hit pretty hard by the Zika uh, epidemic during 2015-16, uh, okay? And what we do is uh, we are trying to kind of, you know, boost capacity in terms of like getting data and uh, also using the app, but also trying to find uh, like uh, other factors like sanitation to try and, uh, you know, limit these uh, risk factors as well. But also we're trying to also, you know, <coughs> generate the capacity of mapping and predicting these hotspots and breeding sites too as well. Um, this is just an image to show you some of the kind of samples that are collected uh, there. So uh, the uh, community health workers or agents, uh, thank you, uh, go there to take these water samples to kind of measure like levels of concentration of like these larvae that are present in households and try to document them in papers. This is also us, uh, you know, getting into contact with this and to kind of showcase the kind of Zika app as well to kind of help boost them in recording uh, uh, these occurrences <laughs> at a household level and so that we can have point level data. But unfortunately, at the moment, uh, the data that is presented to us is recorded and kind of aggregated down to a neighborhood level. And the way the agents operate is on every two monthly interval across the year, they'll visit houses and to do a survey and record whether or not it is infested with either a mosquito or larvae. And just to kind of show, when they inspect a house, um, so these are the type of classifications or the, of how to identify whether a house is infected or not. And these are the kind of things, containers that they will check. So they'll check things like water tanks, they'll check deposits in, in uh, containers that are used for you know, domestic usage, as well as in the external property as well. And so, yeah, just to kind of mention again, just to kind of reiterate, so um, we, I currently have uh, you know, routinely collected data that is provided by um, the um, Environmental Health Agency from Recife. And, uh, I have data on the uh, neighborhoods, and uh, so this kind of preliminary analysis that I've done, I used uh, a spatial temporal model just to look at the kind of trajectories and uh, look at what is the overall risk. And uh, what, for each neighborhood, we have like the overall number of houses that were surveyed, but also the number of houses that were identified to be infected as well. And what we did was uh, I just fitted a, a binomial, uh, a Bayesian a multivariable binomial regression to just quantify the odds ratio, which is basically uh, kind of like an epidemiologic measure that tells you whether if there's an increased risk or a decreased risk. So if you have an odds ratio that is equal to one, then there is no risk at all. But if it's below one, there's a reduced risk and if it is above one, then there's an increased risk. And we try to get them specific to each neighborhood, but also specific to each cycle as well. And so this was the kind of end product that we had here. And so you have the list of neighborhoods, 
and then you have like a, a cycle. So we have 57 cycles from the beginning of January 2015 going down to October. That, and what I wanted to do was just to see uh, the trajectory, whether if a neighbor had a sustained reduced risk of infestation or if it was like sustained elevated risk of infestation. And what we did was just to kind of generate a product to kind of summarize this into this kind of map here. And so if it was sustained as red, which was significant, then we'll paint the neighborhood as red. And if it was blue, we'll paint it as blue. And if it transitioned from low risk to high risk, you had like a kind of light shade of red. And if it was from high risk to low risk, you had a light shade of blue. And if it, if it wasn't significant throughout, then we just kept it white. And so this is just kind of like a concept kind of and preliminary thing, because we just want to get point data, which is high resolution, and only the app which Aisha, which Tiago had mentioned, can achieve that, okay? And so yeah, that's all folks. And so I just want to give a quick shout out to the Miwa family, okay. and also I just would like to thank everyone as well. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, let me ask you, you show a map that uh, at least four kinds of disease happens in, in Brazil. But the, other, the previous map you show where there is no uh, action from the mosquito in a large area in the central east of Brazil and the south of Amazon. So, yeah, the, uh, uh, this one you show that uh, at least four of the five diseases reported. Yes. And the previous one? Or well, the previous one, yeah, this one. Yeah, it's not suitable for either. Uh, yes. I had, you know, this green area here is a very large area in the center, in the center east of Brazil. Yes, so this, this work was published by uh, Lita et al. And the data that they used was, uh, so the ADIS uh, compendium. And what they've done was they had to bring points of surveys that was reported from since, if I could remember, 1973 up to date. And so what they did was they had to take points from like, you know, national health agencies that are willing to share them those surveys. But they also had to do like a literature kind of search and they kind of had to, they had to kind of extract all the, all the points that was reported in those papers as well and geolocated them. And what they did was they used those points to kind of generate this map. Okay. So my thinking is that perhaps maybe they didn't get any studies or any points on this points area. On the, the, yeah. yeah. So I think they weren't able to kind of generate any kind of results here. Yeah, well, yeah. over the Andes probably in the, the south of South America, it's almost desert and quite cold. So, okay. But it's okay. okay. I think it's a good point. Um, yeah. Questions? Any question? Oh, he's a good teacher. I can see that. <laughs> oh, there is one more. Yes, of course. Because, I mean, uh, already, like, the mosquitoes are moving more north as well. In fact, when I was talking about the Rift Valley fever, that's just one example of it actually penetrating into the Americas as well. And um, yeah, North America, in fact. And yeah, I'm sure like, I'm sure because like the, these maps that were generated, because mine, the, the compendium, they use points that was from 2014. I wouldn't be surprised if I was to actually do a quick Google search to see if there are any publications on uh, these type of diseases in these areas as well. And so, yeah, I think that, uh, that the, the boundary of these diseases would, would expand, not just like, you know, north southwards, but it's also going to expand in this, this direction as well. Yeah. There are some reports that the yellow fever and even malaria is going up the Ants Mountain, actually. It wasn't only on the, the bottom, but now it's the more high levels. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.
And at last but not at least, our speaker, uh, Professor Ginart Vasconcelos from ITI, Lorsis, from the Instituto Superior Técnico from yes. Lisbon. Sorry. And the title is going to be Acoustic Sensors for Monitoring Ecosystem. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk here. Uh, I will talk a little. I will talk a little bit about the mosquito in Madeira Island, and after that, I will talk the the sensors that uh, we are being uh, developed. First, the mosquito vector monitoring can be divided in three big approaches: the traditional one, the acoustic and non-acoustic approach. The traditional one is the, the using the manual, uh, manual uh, trumps to count the mosquitoes and identify them. In the acoustic, we can use the, the audio analysis uh, methods, machine learning and deep learning methods, and the acoustic uh, trump devices too. This non-acoustic device is more to identify the breeding sites. So the, normally, they use machine vision uh, based techniques via image processing and high, high speed cameras. And this, in this approach, can be included the uh, ISS sensors too. So here we have the traditional method. That's uh, it's uh, been done uh, in Madeira Island. Uh, as we know, it's a time-consuming uh, method. It's requiring people to go to the different traps and collect the data. So here in this image, we have in, in red, we have the presence of mosquitoes to the, through the eggs, and in blue is not the presence of the mosquitoes. Here is the office trap that normally we use in Madeira with a Velcro tape where the mosquitoes go there and put uh, their eggs. Normally, this one is just applied for the for the AIDS and chips. Here, uh, Funchal is the capital of Madeira Island. Mainly, is a, a tourist uh, touristic uh, island. So the the municipality of, of Funchal start monitoring the the city in October 2005, and uh, the first outbreaks uh, appears in 2013. Uh, uh, currently, uh, the, the city have uh, 28 uh, traps in the, in the city, and in Madeira we just have the Aids uh, Gypsy and the Culex uh, mosquito, that is only these two types of mosquito that can transmit the diseases. We have other species, but they are endemic, but they, they don't transmit the diseases. Here we have a small graph the, for, the, for the first outbreak that's uh, happening. That's happening in uh, Madeira Island. In the y-axis, we have the number of weeks. Uh, one, one here have uh, six, uh, five, 52 uh, uh, weeks. So the peaks normally, uh, the number of cases occurs in the October. So the, normal, the total cases was uh, 1,080 uh, cases. Maybe for a small island like uh, mine, maybe it's a big number. Here we have just a small graph uh, that's showing the trap positivity of uh, over uh, 2020. The, they hit the peak normally in the, in the summer and the beginning of winter, like in the September, October. Now I will talk about the, the prototypes that were, have uh, been developed and that, that are being uh, developed. The first prototype is the locomobiles. Uh, it's composed by a layer, a layer of sensors, uh, like microphone, temperature, and, re and relative humidity. We think that these two, uh, these two environmental uh, readings is the most important to classify the mosquito. And uh, this prototype uh, uses open source hardware, the particle photon microcontroller, uh, have a powerful core and a Wi-Fi chips, chip that. Uh, connects all the sensors and send the data to, to our server. We have two uh, local storage too, IRTC, to see the, the timestamp when the, the mosquito passed close to the sensor. And in this approach, uh, we just use the, the classification based on the frequency of each mosquito. Uh, as, we are, as I already said, we send the data to our uh, web-based uh, interface. We can search and download the sounds and the spectrograms, the spectrograms too. But uh, this first version have some issues. Uh, 
like in remote locations, we don't have always the Wi-Fi. So it's a challenge. We need to change the, the prototype. When we use the Wi-Fi communication, still consume a lot of power. And one, one important feature that we, are, uh, that we are looking for is to change the audio quality parameter, like the gain and the volume. Because in, when we are in the presence of uh, high environmental noise, uh, environmental, uh, when we are in the presence of uh, and, uh, on the high uh, noise environment, we need to change the gain. And we are in the low environmental gain, we can increase the gain to hear better. And we, in this prototype, we don't have a self-charged battery system too. And this prototype is limited to just samples that can go until, until uh, 8K. So we merge with the version 2 that have some uh, environmental sensors that have a self-battery system and now can go until 44.1K. We can adjust locally and uh, remote the volume and, and the gain. We can listen the sounds in the field that we are capturing. And this, uh, uh, this version have, have the LoRa technology that is a long range communication uh, technology that can be used to, for the data to the, from some gateway and uh, sent to the server. This one, uh, have, we can save some uh, consumption here because uh, compared with the Wi-Fi technology. Here uh, is the, the gateway that we are, the, currently we have three, three gateways, LoRa gateways installed in the, in the main city of Funchal. Uh, the, the municipality have more uh, 13 uh, gateways, so we have a total of uh, 16 gateways that cover all the area of Funchal. So as this load is a low power technology, long range and long band solution. That picture there is the dashboard that we can see the gateways and the device that are connected. And we can imagine there the, the data lab, the acoustic uh, uh, recordings and the, the metadata like uh, uh, the temperature and the relative humidity. So these pictures are the first uh, deployment that we made in Thailand. So, but we found some issues too, like how we can uh, estimate the mosquito density. Uh, to do that, we need to count the mosquitoes. So using acoustic sensors, some, somehow it's difficult to count them. It still consumes some energy, and we have, when we have in the presence of uh, high environmental noise, we have a loss. Uh, the classification method that we use is, uh, is not good. In this prototype, to classify the mosquitoes, we use the audio features. We have the most used, the 34 audio features, time domain, frequency, spectral, and the common features too. Here we have a box bot uh, about the, for the, uh, all 34 features. The best one is the, the male frequency spectral coefficients come from 1 to 13. And in blue, we have the Kulix, and in brown, we have the Aiza Gypsy. Here is our system that we are implementing. We have this uh, pre-processing stage that segment the audio, uh, to, uh, use the best, uh, the best audio features. Uh, after that, uh, in the proce uh, processing stage, we, we use the clustering uh, method because, why we use this, the, the clustering? Because it's a lightweight method that we can use on, in the onboard devices. We have three, three types of clusters for ASI Gypsy, cool extent for environmental noise. Here is this uh, small overview in this table about the best features to classify the mosquitoes. When we have the presence of noise, uh, still the currency drop a little bit, but uh, is around 81.7%, I think is a good occurrence. And, we have, and we, the method that we use is GMM and the Gibbs sampler methods. Here in this picture, in the red, we have the noise. Uh, in blue, we have the Aiza Gypsy, and in, in the red, we have the Coolix for uh, spectral, sp uh, spectral centroid and spectral spread. So we merged with the, thread, the version 3 that have now um, a more powerful uh, core, have more memory for the machine learning algorithm and have infrared technology. Here's the overview about the, the models. 
invite the, lo the, the LoRa model, orange the acoustic one, the yellow the environmental model, white the optical model, in purple we have the, the, the audio model, and cyan we have the memory, in black the core, and blue the battery model. Here we have the acoustic system, the, the optical system, we use uh, uh, Fresnel lens to focus the, the uh, array emitter and we have an uh, array box that receive uh, is, is like a box when the mosquito pass through they, the, the device uh, count them and classify, and classify them. Here we have a small video how to adjust the, and focus the Fresnel lens. Here we have the, the optical shield that uh, uh, can be used for uh, four Fresnel lens that composing a four, four, array, four array. And we have to provide a more uh, robust uh, architecture. We, uh, we, uh, we build four types of adapter. For high emitter, five millimeters. For high emitter, uh, with four, uh, three millimeters. For a small uh, Fresnel lens and R receiver. Here's just a small comparison about all the, the versions that we have deployment. Here's the, the, the computation power about for the three versions that we, that we do. And here's the final uh, system that we want to, to implement. We have the acoustic uh, process to trigger the acoustic uh, uh, classification system. We, we send through LoRa and the LoRa we can use uh, you can enter in the, uh, the web-based interface and then see the, the which type of mosquitoes that we detected and so on. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Vasconcelos. Questions? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your questions. Uh, the first one is uh, the accuracy. I think is good when we have in the presence of noise uh, for this, just for Aedes aegypti and Culex. I don't consider the, the the other species. It's around uh, eighty-one point seven percent the average for the the Gibbs sample because it's, it's the most uh, lightweight mo model that that we can use on board. The average is uh, eighty-one point seven percent for these features because this one. Is the best combined audio feature that, yeah. Okay. We mix all 34 combinations and we find that this one's com this combination is the best one. Uh, using the, C the CNN and this one, we, 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 do, we don't try yet because that one is a deep learning model. We, uh, we will test in, the, in, the, in these devices because this one have a more powerful uh, core. Do you think it will fit onto that device? Yes. Yes, yes, We're, we already tested just to recognize our voice, yes or no, okay. and, and work, so. We can implement machine learning too, like uh, CVM, uh, CVM and other uh, random forest algorithms too. But like, like, like I said, if you use more robust machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms, the device will consume more. Yeah, so, yeah. It's, it's we, so we update for the clustering because it's more easy. Please. Thank you for your time. Um, one is the funny curious cases in terms of power transfers. Um yeah, and then the second question is to give you a line in the account of like both image and the audio signal. Sorry, I don't don't hear the second question. I don't hear. Combine the, uh, the audio and also the... Yeah, he's, I think he's asking what if you, you are planning to combine the yeah. image data. In the, the audio. audio ah, no, no, no. Because for that, you, you will increase the cost of the system. To, just to, to produce one of these devices, just one, is 110 euros. If you produce 100, it uh, drops to 65 euros. 
if you add a high speed camera and, and other systems to uh, transmit the image because to transmit the image you need Wi-Fi at least because we, you need more uh, uh, bandwidth. So it will, uh, will make the device more expensive. And the other question? We have one more. Yes, we have using the when we test the, in the first uh, in the Thailand uh, in the here we we find some uh, false positives. So we move for to uh, optical because when the mosquito pass, we know that this is mosquito. Let's start the corn. It's to save battery and to have a more classification system, more robust classification. Okay. Thank you, Professor Vasconcelos. And uh, I think that's the end of our session. Let's uh, thank all the presenters and also the audience to be here.